Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome to the show today. It's such a pleasure to have you with us as we study the Word of God together. You know, if you wanted to find an example of faith under trial in the New Testament, I don't know if you could find a better one than the Apostle Paul. He's almost like the New Testament version of Job. I mean, he is a man who has lost or has forsaken all for the sake of Jesus Christ. He has suffered tremendous persecution, unbelievable hardship for the purposes of carrying out the mission that Christ gave him to preach and teach the gospel. And today we find Paul on trial. He's been in prison for some time, and he has come under the authority of Governor Felix. But Felix, though we can't find grounds on which to convict Paul, he won't acquit him because he doesn't want to anger the Jewish leaders who are accusing Paul. And so, as per their request, he offers to send Paul from Caesarea all the way back to Jerusalem to be tried there. But Paul, knowing that he had less chance of getting justice there and wanting to get to Rome anyways, he appeals to Caesar, which was his right as a Roman citizen. And so Festus says, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you shall go. Now, Festus can't quite wipe his hands clean of Paul just yet because it already looked bad for Festus that one of the first cases he tried there in Caesarea, the defendant had to appeal to Caesar to get justice. And it's going to look even worse if he sends Paul to Rome without any charges that even make sense. But with King Herod Agrippa and Bernice coming to visit him, he decides to have Paul's hearing in front of Agrippa so that Agrippa can hear and kind of help Festus to establish charges. And so King Agrippa and Bernice come, and Festus turns Paul's hearing into this elaborate, pompous show for both of them, in their honor. And after King Agrippa and Bernice parade in, and all of the pompousness has been quieted down, Festus, he gets up and addresses Agrippa explaining the situation once again. And it says in Acts 26, starting at verse 1, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. And so Paul gives what is his third apologetic defense speech in the book of Acts. And five key statements summarize Paul's defense. It says, So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And that's the first key statement. I lived a Pharisee. But of course, the Jewish leaders, they weren't willing to testify to that fact because they knew what weight Paul's former life as a Pharisee would add to his defense. And so on this, they keep very, very silent. But Paul declares it. And using the power of story, he seeks to connect with even them as well. He's saying, I was just like you. And that sets the stage for his explanation of what forever changed the course of his life and what might change the course of their lives as well. He says, And now I stand 
and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our twelve tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? And the word you here is actually plural in the Greek indicating that Paul, he's now looking around at and addressing everyone. Now, the Greeks and Romans, they didn't believe in the doctrine of the resurrection, nor did the Sadducees who were present. But the doctrine of the resurrection was and is the, and I mean the, most critical doctrine of the Christian faith. Paul himself says as much in 1 Corinthians 15. If there's no resurrection, then obviously Jesus could not have been raised. Therefore, our sins could not have been paid for. And so we would then still be lost in our sins. And Paul would have no gospel to even preach. And so Paul brings the focus right where it needs to be on the resurrection of Jesus and how that historical event made all the difference in his life. He says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Now here, he's identifying with the Jewish leaders in his audience. He's saying, I understand why you hate me, why you have so set yourselves against me. I was the same way. I was also zealous. But my zeal, it wasn't based on knowledge, as he says of them in Romans 10.2. And so I did to them, these Christians, exactly what you guys are seeking to do to me. But then he says, While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And that's key statement number two. I saw a light. You might call Paul an enlightened man, literally. He was a Jew, a scholar, and at least he thought a righteous Pharisee. But Paul goes on to describe how he came to discover that while he had thought he was a righteous Pharisee, he in reality had been in spiritual darkness. And Jesus had right then and there, on that Damascus road, struck him blind, casting him into the darkness for three days, so that he might come to embrace the light of the world. Now, all this is pretty dramatic stuff, but in a way it had to be, because there was no other way to explain how such a dedicated and zealous Pharisee so set against Christianity could himself then become a Christian. It had to come through seeing the resurrected Lord Jesus himself. And that is what he describes next. He says in verse 14, And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And that's key statement number three. I heard a voice. And Paul tells his audience that the voice spoke to him in the Hebrew language. Now, some say it was Aramaic, but I disagree for a number of reasons, two of which I'll mention here. First of all, the text actually says Hebrew in the original Greek. And that alone, I think, should give us pause. But secondly, why would Paul highlight this detail if it wasn't actually Hebrew? Who would care? Nobody. 
The reason he mentions it is because he's connecting the resurrection of Jesus with the promises that God made to the Hebrew people. He himself is a Hebrew who met the promised Hebrew Messiah, who confirmed his Hebrewness by speaking to him in Hebrew, calling him by his Hebrew name, Saul. By the way, it's a common misconception that God changed Saul's name to Paul. That never happened. Saul was the name that Paul used when among Jews in and around Jerusalem. And Paul, his Roman name, was the name that he used abroad around Gentiles. Now, there is a shift in the book of Acts from Saul to Paul. But the reason we see that shift is because Paul became primarily a minister to the Gentiles. And it's not until Acts chapter 13, verse 9, that we find the last reference to his name being Saul. And here it's important to note that Jesus called him by his Hebrew name. And using that Hebrew name, Jesus asks Paul in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, that's kind of a weird statement, kick against the goads. What does that mean? Well, when a young ox was first yoked, that ox would usually resist the yoke and try to kick its way out. If it was a single-handed plow that it was yoked to, what the plowman would do was he would take a long staff with a sharpened end and he would hold it close to the ox's heels. And then when the ox would kick, it would strike the spike. And similarly, if the ox was yoked to a wagon, there would be a studded bar with wooden spikes that would serve the same purpose. Now, the reason that Jesus had used this imagery was because the ox had to learn submission to the yoke the hard way. And so Jesus is saying, Saul, you're that ox. You're resisting me. Do we have any goad kickers today listening in? (laughs) I know at times I've been a goad kicker. But if so, there's hope for you when you respond to the voice as Saul did. He says, so I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, I love how Paul never hides any detail that he thinks might hurt his case particularly those details concerning how God had called him as a missionary to the Gentiles, something the Jewish leaders have and will continue to react violently against. No, Paul took every opportunity available to him to proclaim that the Gentiles have an equal share in God's inheritance in Jesus Christ. And he talks about how this inheritance is the promise and blessing of the covenant that God had made all the way back with Abraham. And how Jesus himself had appointed him to bring this good news to the Gentiles. And you know what? I'm a Gentile. And many of you listening today are as well. And so I want to ask you, how did that happen? Well, it happened because somewhere in time past, a Jew, like Paul, but of course there were many others, was willing to cross some social barrier and perhaps to go through some intense trials and persecutions to help make that happen. Now, if that is true, and it is, then the question is, are you and I returning the favor? Are there people that we are becoming uncomfortable for? so that they might have the opportunity to hear the gospel as well. 
Who have you willingly chained yourself to so that they might come to experience the light of life in Jesus Christ? In that sense, I want to encourage you, become chained this week. Bind yourself to somebody. Do what Christ leads you to do and empowers you to do to be a witness to them so that they might experience the same joy that you now have in him. Let's do so. Amen. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God. 